Welcome to how and why to use Ruby's method missing. Here's what we're going to do in this video. First, we're going to look at why method missing exists, and then we're going to look at a method missing example. We'll build an attribute setter, and we'll see in just a second exactly what that means. So first, let's talk about why it is that method missing exists. Now, normally, when we send a message to an object, that is when we do dot such and such on an object, the message we send corresponds to a method that exists on that object. For example, if we have an object called user and we do user.firstName, we expect that there's a method called .firstName. And obviously, calling .firstName will work if there's an attribute called firstName with a public accessor. There just has to be something called firstName defined. But what if we wanted to be able to send messages to objects dynamically? Like let's say, for example, our user class doesn't have a method or an accessor called first name, but we want user to have a method for each column that exists on a database table. So in other words, we want to be able to do dot first name by virtue of the fact that there's a column that exists called first name. The way we accomplish things like this in Ruby is by using method missing. Let's now look at a concrete example. It won't be the example using database tables because that's too complicated. What we'll do is create a class that allows us to set arbitrary attributes by doing dot set such and such attribute name. You'll see exactly what I mean in just a second. Here's the starting code. It obviously won't work because we're calling this method called set first name, but there's no set first name method defined and no method missing either. But this at least illustrates the idea that we're going for. Before we do anything else, let's just see what happens when we run this code. We get an error that says undefined method set first name, which makes sense because again, we don't have a method defined called set first name. Let's make this error message go away by adding a usage of method missing. This might look like a big change, so let's take it bit by bit. First of all, Lines 8 and 9 are the exact same as before, so we don't have to worry about those. Let's focus on lines 2 through 5, which are different. What we've added is a definition for a special method called method missing. Every usage of method missing has basically the same function signature, meaning it has the same name and parameters. The first parameter is method name, which, straightforwardly enough, is the name of the method that was called. As an example, on line 9, we're doing user.setFirstName, so the method name would come through as setFirstName. The other parameter, args, represents any arguments that were passed to the method that was called. So to use line 9 as an example again, args would come through as JSON, because the argument that we're passing is JSON. By the way, you might wonder what that asterisk is all about that precedes args on line 2. That's an aspect of Ruby that perhaps calls for its own in-depth explanation, but long story short, it's called the splat operator, and it will take a list of arguments and convert that list of arguments into an array. So if we had had two arguments on line 9 instead of one, args would be an array with two elements. And in fact, the splat operator isn't going to behave differently depending on whether we have one, two, three, four, any number of elements. So the number one isn't special. We're happening to pass just one argument, but the splat operator still converts our one argument into an array. Anyway, the last thing I want to highlight in our new code is what we're doing inside this method missing definition. As you can see on lines three and four, all we're doing is putsing method name and args. Our goal right now isn't to actually do anything useful, it's just to begin to understand how method missing works. Now, having said all that, let's run this code and see what we get. Not too surprising, we get our method name and the argument that we passed. This is a good start, but not terribly useful yet. Out of set first name, we want to grab just the first name part. So let's add some code to do that. First, here's the code that we just ran. And here's the code that will get first name out of set first name. As you can see on line three, we're just taking a substring that starts at the fifth character, index four, and goes until the end. Let's run this and observe what we get. We get first name without the set, which of course is exactly right. Now let's take the next step of setting the value that we're passing on line nine, JSON, 
to an instance variable that matches what was specified by the method name, set first name. So in other words, when we call user.setFirstName JSON, let's make it so that an instance variable called first name gets set to the value JSON. Here's what that code looks like. Let's first focus on line four, where we say instance variable set. And if you're not familiar with instance variable set, we'll come back to that. But first, let's focus on what we're setting. Recall that if we call user.setFirstName, then atter name on line three gets set to first name. So on line four, where we're saying at sign, and then we're interpolating at her name, that gets interpreted as at sign first name. Now also recall that args contains an array of the arguments that were passed when we called set first name. In this case, we're only passing one argument, JSON, but it still comes through as an array. So if we want to get the value JSON, we have to do args zero. So to sum all that up, Line four is saying instance variable set at first name to JSON. And again, if you're not familiar with instance variable set, what we're doing here, instance variable set at first name JSON, is exactly equivalent to saying at first name equals JSON. And then on line 10, because we have no public accessor called first name, and in fact, no public accessors at all, we have to do another little trick, which is instance variable get and you can probably assume how that works. Finally, let's run this code and see what we get. Since we're doing user.setFirstName JSON, and then we're immediately saying puts user.instanceVariable get first name, we should expect that it would output the first name attribute, which of course is JSON. So let's see. And we do get JSON, so that's great. However, this doesn't yet feel like incontrovertible proof that our code is working as expected. It would be good to see multiple examples of setting different arbitrary attributes on our object. So let's take this code, which only sets a first name attribute, and let's also set a last name attribute. And when we run this, we do in fact see the first name attribute, JSON, and the last name attribute, Sweat. And as a final comment, it's highly likely that you'll see method missing sometimes with a third parameter, and block. I didn't cover that parameter in this video, and I'm not going to give it any special treatment because it's actually true that any Ruby method can take a block, and the way that method missing's block parameter works is no different from the way any other Ruby methods and block parameter works. So I'm leaving that part out in order to avoid confusion and redundancy. If you understand method missing's first two parameters, then that's all you need. Thanks for watching this video. To find my blog posts, products, podcasts, and other videos, visit codewithjason.com.